on everybody, Jake Adams from Reef Builders here. Finally found some time to sit down with one of my absolute favorite reefers. His name is Chris Cap of Aquatic Art Inc. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you too. Now, the reason you've never heard of Chris Cap is because he ain't got no time to be writing articles and to be spending time on bulletin boards because this guy is busy building, designing, and maintaining reef tanks and his support facility has turned into one of the best aquarium stores in Denver. It's one of the best kept secrets outside of Colorado. But in the local scene, everybody knows you wanna be here on a Friday and a Saturday. Isn't that right, Chris? That worry, we are hoping that. But yes, most people, um, we, we've been able to get a, a big enough crowd um, to make justify being open for retail, so it's been really good. All right, so I really wanted to spend some time to introduce Chris Cap to uh, the wider audience because uh, Chris was a speaker at Reefstock in Denver, and in just a few short weeks, he's going to be coming to Australia for Reefstock Australia in Sydney on August 17th and 18th. Make sure to check out reefstock.show for all the event details and the Facebook event page for up to the minute announcements about raffle prizes and what some of the different uh, vendors and stuff will be bringing. So I'm super excited about it. So my Reef Aquarium respect for Chris is neck and neck with Julian, Sanjay, and Kevin Cohen. These are four people who answer my questions when I hit a brick wall. And I've actually wanted him as a speaker for Reefstock since the very beginning, since 2008. So it's a really big deal to finally have him be able to participate and to come to, uh, and to come to Reefstock Australia. And so Jake said, if you speak at the Denver Reefstock, then I'll fly you to Australia to speak at the Australian Reefstock, so the Sydney Reefstock. So how can you say no to that? Yeah. So there was no way to say no. So just tell us, you know, in summary, like your path from becoming a hobbyist to becoming a professional aquarist. Well, 1983 was my first saltwater aquarium. I had um, freshwater aquariums since I, I can remember. Um, but it just, it was a natural progression. I, I went to college, had a, a 15 gallon in my dorm room. Uh, and then when the reefing scene kind of came and my budget kind of came along a little bit better too, then I started keeping um, corals and live rock. And, and uh, so it's been a long journey. Um, 2003 was probably one of my favorite years because I was on the, uh, the Reef Central uh, Reef Keeping Magazine Tank of the Month. Uh, Do you remember when Tank of the Month on Reef Central was a big deal? This guy was on it in 2003. He's got that iconic image of a green polyp leather before there was any green polyp leathers around. I have the picture with the, the algae blenny in it. With a, bit, with, sitting in with it. a lawnmower blenny just sitting in it. That was just, that's still like, I think a lot of people will know that picture. That was this guy right here in 2003. So. so what's really cool about Chris's shop is it looks like you're walking into a regular fish store. First of all, when you walk into this place, He's got what you need. He's got it in stock. He's not going to be, you know, he can order up anything just like any store, but you come in and you find the test kits that you need are in stock, the accessories that you need, frag plugs, glue, all that stuff in stock, rock. Um, you know, you really operate this from the point of view of a hobbyist and you cater to the hobbyist, but you can, you know, you can get people started. So that's what really cool about this place. But this is not exactly a fish store. This is more like a support location for your maintenance business. Yes. And when we started the maintenance business, it was out of our basement, and we would have employees that would come, and they would have to uh, haul the water up the stairs to go out to the maintenance accounts. And then eventually, we got to a point financially that we could get this facility, um, and we moved in. And our intention was just to have more room so we could get all of the maintenance out of our house and into some other facility. And then it kind of progressed, and so. Uh, um, it's about a 1,300 square foot facility here, and and uh, and so yeah, that's how it started. So, Chris's warehouse space um, definitely had something to do and inspiration with me setting up my studio. So I have a comparable space, some extra thousand square feet. I know, I out. know. But it, he has way more coral. You've got at least a thousand corals in here. We've got sticks. We've got LPS. We've got zoanthids. And we have a fantastic show tank that we're going to talk about now. So thank you for bearing with us, those of you still watching, to introduce this very fine reefer here because now we're going to talk 
about Chris's flagship reef tank. Now, what's really interesting about this tank is, man, if I, if I gave you a video of this tank every nine months, it would look quite different because he does, he grows corals really fast, he grows them really, really big, and it seems like every 18 months or so, there's like a major overhaul just to kind of keep everything in check. So um, just, for, just for starters, tell us the, the, the basics about the tank. What is the volume? What is the age? And what is dimensions? It's uh, eight feet by 36 by 36. Um, it's about, um, about 500 gallons. Um, uh, We've had this tank up for about nine years, but it, Has like- Has it been that long? Yep. You've been in this space nine years? Almost nine years coming up, so. <laughs> I know it goes by quick. Holy crap. Um, and, but about two years ago, we had a seam um, on the aquarium that, that was very suspect. Yeah, yeah, it was sketchy looking. Uh, so we decided to change it out with the Planet Aquarium's um, uh, tank, but all the corals, all the SPS were grown and they were all intertwined and they were at the surface and everything. So when we had to remove everything and I decided to take everything down and take it into this softball size or baseball size manageable piece so we could continue on for the next few years. Cause, uh, and then we just regrow it. So it, it, we're on the process of regrowing and we have some, we have some time to go still, but um, I also didn't put as many corals. I usually pack it, I'm a hobbyist. So you have to pack as many corals as you can in there. This time I said, I'm just gonna let them grow in naturally a little bit better. And so maybe I showed a little more restraint, maybe not, I don't know, but. So you said this was a Planet Aquarium? Planet Aquariums, it's got an OptiWhite uh, glass front. So it's, uh, a, it's a high clarity glass front, yep. but not the sides? <clears throat> but not the sides. So this tank is resting on a steel stand. Tube steel stand. And that yep. was locally made. Um, no, this one actually was not. Um, this one was out of a company. They're no longer in business either, but um, they actually epoxy painted it, which I would have liked to uh, had um, the powder coating instead. So I'm um, having a little bit of trouble with that. But. So tell us about the lighting you started with. And you've, you know, we're, we're hobbyists. We're tweaking with our tanks and we're playing around and trying to figure out what works best. So what did you start with? And uh, where are you at and how did you come to that? We, um, <clears throat> when I first set up this aquarium, I put um, AI soles on it. It was the top of the line um, affordable for yeah, me. Nine, nine years ago, I mean, this AI sole was putting out some power. Yes, absolutely. And it, and it grew corals and it, it did great. But I have always had metal halides and, um, and with radium bulbs in. So I, did, I felt like it was going great but it wasn't just the same as when I had my halides. And so I decided to take the AIs off and put the halides back on. Um, I tinkered with some T5s, with some reef bright strips and some different things. And then finally I just decided to keep the halides and then we have four Hydro 52s that kind of give that all blue color um, that kind of offset the, the whiteness of the, uh, the halides right now. So um, that's kind of where I'm at now. Next week, I don't know, but probably <laughs> the halides are going to stay. Um, that's pretty a pretty so, sure so, bet. So I love it because he's got uh, basically a foundation of the new Hydra 52s, and then the nutritious lighting comes on for how many hours a day? Um, uh, eight hours a day. And uh, what power and how many of them do you have? The um, on the the hydras, the halides, the halides. Um, they're 400 watts. Um, you have four hundreds in there. No, 400s. Four 400s. Four 400s, um, 1,600 watts of metal halide, and then how many isoles? Um, four. Uh, hydras. 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 Hydra 52s, there's four. Hydras are, the whites are, I don't have the whites on, but I have the the blues on full blast. So he's using <laughs> he's using the Hydra 52s as blue supplementation I, to the metal halides. And I'll tell you guys, I mean, for a tank this size, it's almost a knife's edge whether you, you go with just like a blanket of LEDs or you just, you still, even to this day, use a bunch of metal halides and, uh, you know, supplement with LEDs, so. Pros and cons to both, I, there really are. I, you know, but it's hard to get through the halide um, and, and budget. I had a lot of these fixtures and so it was an easy budgetary decision to put them on. So as you can see, Chris has uh, a really unique and personal approach to the lighting for his sticks, for his fuzzy sticks. So tell us about the flow. What, what kind of pumps do you have on here and uh, how do you manage the, the circulation inside of it? We have, uh, I have 
two MP60s on the sides, and I have two MP40s in the back. And then we we have about um, 1,500 gallons of water going from the sump uh, back into the aquarium. Um, I went with a bare, bare bottom aquarium, so I, I've been inching that that flow up. Um, and when you look at like the torches and the gonopora, um, they seem to just thrive in in that just, environment. You had sand in the tank when it was acrylic, yep. but then when you put it in. When you moved everything to the glass tank, you just didn't put the sand in to start. Just, we were doing so, you know, you, on one day we took the tank off, took everything out, put everything back in, and I thought, you know, let's not put the sand in right now. Let's avoid one possible thing that could that could cause problems with the, the system. So, um, and I had had bare bottom. I had had every, all my corals up on a crate. I mean, back in the days, you know, we went through deep sand bed. We've, we've done all everything. The things. So I just decided not to put it on there, uh, put the sand back in, and and I've really liked it. Um, I'm not as good as I should be at, at sucking out detritus in the spots that it collects, but um, I I don't miss the sand. Um, You've been able to increase the water flow. It really shows in your flower pot corals and your torch coral collection. You have some some amazing specimens. So you're pretty thrilled with the flow though, right? Absolutely, yeah. I, I would like to point out <clears throat> that, uh, what kind of pump do you use for your return? Um, I use a Dolphin Amp Master 6250. So the 1500 gallons, he's saying, that's actually 1500 gallons making it to the tank. Not 1500 gallons from a DC pump that then has to pump five feet. And that's that's a pressure rated pump that's pushing through the you know little miniature penductors. So it's multiplying that flow throughout the tank. See, we're starting to lose some halides, so got to hurry up a little bit here. <laughs> um, all right, so what's the most major components of the filtration of this tank? Um, it's Berlin style. I have two big skimmers on it. Um, I have a media reactor that we use, activated carbon or GFO, depending on what our needs of the aquarium are. Um, and I also have a geo calcium reactor um, and a geo uh, Kalk Wasser stir or Nielsen reactor. I am um, such a big proponent of using a calcium reactor with a calc reactor because one lowers your pH and adds more alkalinity and the other one increases your pH and adds a little bit more calcium. So how did you come to the, that conclusion of using both? You know, I think the biggest thing was um, years and years ago, I read an article about caulk phosphor and the benefits of caulk phosphor and uh, I've always tried to incorporate it into as many aquariums as I can. It just seemed like a natural uh, to natural to put on a, a Nielsen reactor when you have a calcium reactor because you're lowering your pH and we're raising our pH and so I, it seemed to me that it would be neutral um, in a sense. It, it would at least offset each other. Plus I would be able to use even more caulk phosphor um, depending on what my usage is for alkalinity and calcium but I would be able to use it into my system um, and have all the benefits of caulk phosphor which are um, raising pH and adding calcium and alkalinity and precip precipitating phosphates out of the water. Right. So I, I can use that tool and, and it actually helps me with the calcium reactor. Right on. So what are some uh, notable corals that are inside the tank? Let's start with the Jedi Mind Trick because you have the biggest colony of Jedi Mind Trick. Maybe like in the ocean, like I haven't seen that many monoporous much bigger than this. Like occasionally you see them, you know, the size of a room, but as far as like domestically, that thing is a beast. He's grown exponentially. Um, this, is, this is while you're hacking at it. Yeah. <laughs> right? You haven't just put a frag there and left it. You've, you've been working it. I think that if I hadn't fragged it, it would be at least half the tank and probably up until the glass because um, we, we frag it all the time. In fact, a lot of our service accounts have giant pieces now because <laughs> we hack a big chunk, put it in there, and then it grows. Um, we were just talking about you know, a huge one shading a bunch of corals in a, in a real big service account that we have, and we got to cut that, so I need to sell more frags. I need to sell more frags of that. <laughs> All right, uh, tell, tell the, the viewers about the coral that's precious to both of us, the Herlock Gani. It's right behind me. It's right here. And the Herlock Gani um, is named after one of our uh, local reefers here um, in Colorado. His name was Steve Herlock. Um, both Jake and I and other reefers across Colorado used to go up to his house. He had a 550 gallon bow front and a 1200 gallon reef tank. And we, I always used to see that coral. And it was this big 
for like 11 to 12 years. Yeah. It was just a small little chunk that he managed and it was highlighter yellow. We always thought it was bleachy. So um, we used to go up there and um, I remember one time it, it's, it um, threw out a little bud and it was in the sand and I was like, Steve, I want that. And so I dug in, it was a big tank, it's a very tall tank. Finally got it, brought it back, killed it, I don't know why. But when Steve um, uh, went through some health issues and so he uh, broke down in both of his tanks and that was one of the corals that I absolutely had to have um, out of his tank because I'd been going up there and looking at it for years years, and loving the coral and so we still have it. Um, we've been given corals, uh, this frags of this coral to a bunch of people, especially everybody that knew Steve always got a uh, Herlock Ghani so it was kind of a, just a, a something that since he's he passed away then he could be in everybody's reef tank is yeah. that whole idea so. so it's a highlighter yellow with kind of reddish tentacles and flower pot coral i don't know what happened in the last few years all of a sudden flower pots were impossible to keep but you kind of have one two now they grow like crazy which is something that the Australian reefers are really good at. So that is something you're going to love about Australia. I love Ghanis. I'm going to look at every Ghani everywhere. Um, so the Australians have been really good at uh, working with what they have. You know, sometimes they lament the, the fact that they only get Australian corals. But if you're only going to get corals from one region, Australia is it. So they've been focusing on the euphilias and the flower pots. And so the, the, the Ganiopora scene at Reefstock Australia is off the hook. You're going to get schooled a little bit because I get schooled a little bit. I, I, I want to get schooled on that coral because I, I love them and I've always loved them. And, and I think it all started with Herlock Gani. That's where my love was because we used to always get the old other ones that would you would keep for six to eight months and then they would eventually get brown jelly and or fade away. So, um, and so, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what they have to offer. Let's talk about your Space Invader Pectinia. Now, this is a fast-growing, hardy coral. It's it's not hard to grow, but you give it room, and this thing was was this size like six months ago, and then you hacked it all down, and now it's back. We we probably every four or five months we'll take it and we'll take off probably thirty to forty percent of the volume of the, the coral. Um, once again, it's in all of our service accounts now because we have big colonies. Um, I, I agree, you give it a little bit of room and the thing grows. It, it, it grows, it's, it's not a, a delicate coral by any, by any means. Plus it sends out sweepers, but the sweepers aren't like, um, you know, real long like Glaxi or something like that. They're just short and fat and so you can kind of contain it in that area. Right on. And you have a pretty good assortment of some uh, very hot corals nowadays, the torch corals. You've got a nice Australian gold and then a couple of these sort of holy grails. Yeah, tell us about those. Um, yeah, it's amazing that the local network here in, in I, most of these were all trade-ins, trade, trade -ins, people breaking down their tank and so I would buy them from them. Um, I think it's real important to give them flow, more flow than I ever did before and when I give them a lot of flow Man, their growth rate is just outstanding. Torch corals are, are, are different. They love a lot of flow. It's just really, it's funny, It's but it's also cool to see so much hype around these corals because we know as long-term aquarists that the prices will go down and the appreciation across the board will remain. They've gone, the, the prices have gone skyrocketing both on the, the retail side and the wholesale side because of demand. Um, but the, you know, to some of the ones that we were lucky enough to get and, and be able to put in our tank and farm, um, once you give them a little bit of time, they really do grow well. So, so um, what would you say about your chemistry for these tanks? We talked about how you maintain the mineral balance with the calc reactor and the calcium reactor, um, but what are some other things that you aim for as far as like feeding or additives? What is, what's, what's on your head list? <laughs> you know, I, I think the calcium reactor does a lot for us, um, you know, with, with bringing in minerals, um, different trace elements and, and different components. Um, we feed this tank about um, usually two to three times a week with an assortment of, of the Brightwell um, phytoplankton uh, products. Which, which Brightwell coral food do you use? The... Because uh, there's the O, which is really fine, the S, which is small, and then the A for like anemones. We use, um, we use a combination of the O and the S. Okay. So I mix the both of them together. Um, and then just broadcast feed this tank. Um, others, other places inside the, our facility would then we'll do hand feeding, but this tank I'm too lazy 
I just throw it in and it clouds the water and I think that um, you can see polyp extension. Put in the acro power in there? Acro power, of course. Um, <laughs> He's one of my first converts. You really see it in the stony corals. Yeah, absolutely. We have our gallon jug over there and, and um, we love the acro power. Um, been using it and it's not just for acros, um, you know, it, it's good for all corals. It's an amino acid. It's not small. You know, what is one piece of advice you try to impart on people doing their saltwater aquariums. It's a little bit different coming from you because you're not just a general hobbyist. You're literally giving advice, you know, throughout the week to people. Like, so what is that, the one thing that you think that, you know, you really want people to pay attention to the most? You know, I think, I think one of the biggest things is, is it has to start with water chemistry um, first and foremost and getting into some kind of a routine and what you do. Um, things change, things adapt inside your aquarium. Usage goes up and goes down depending on what the aquarium's doing. And so it, it has to start with water chemistry and having water chemistry be your number one goal. Um, and then some of the other things are, are enhancement. Well, I can't, can't really say enhancements, but water chemistry is the start. Yep. So getting the into a routine, the fundamentals, getting a routine and keeping it the same and watching these corals as they adapt, then they start to really grow and flourish at that point. Man, this guy really is a wealth of information. I'm so excited that you're going to be at Reefstock Australia I'm after excited. Reefstock Denver. Do you want to tell people what your talk is going to be about? Um, basically, what we just kind of touched on it is is it, um, it's entitled um, "Keeping Healthy Corals," but it's some things that you can go online and read about boron and all these different trace elements and all these different reef keepers, especially when you're starting out. You you there's too much information. They get clogged with information and. So then they're chasing numbers on different things that may or may not be important. They're just chasing. So my talk is about getting back and let's start at the very beginning and taking care of all the most um, important things that are in an aquarium. And then once you've mastered those, then we talk about enhancements, feeding, um, different lighting, you know, all these other things that can do, but you have to have the basics. You can have $10,000 worth of lights and your DKH is six, five, it's not gonna work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. You um, can have so. all the bells and whistles and controllers and automatic doohickeys, but if you don't master the, the fundamentals, which I would say is temperature, pH, salinity, calcium, magnesium, alkalinity, nutrition, and the, you know a couple of flourishes, that's 90% that's of the game. Like, that's everything that people are talking about as far as amino acids and certain trail elements and weirdo techniques, that's not going to fundamentally change the success of your reef tank. It doesn't, and people come into the shop every weekend and, and they ask, why is my euphilia or my hammer not opening up? And one of my first questions is temperature, salinity, and alkalinity. <laughs> and if they don't know that, then we have to go talk about test kits, because <laughs> that's how it goes. And we can change the lights, we can do whatever, but if you don't have the basics. So that's what I'll be talking about. Very cool. I don't think it's uh, any coincidence that two reefers that have been in the hobby for a long time um, really stress the importance of healthy corals. People always ask, how do I get my corals to grow faster? How do I get them brighter? I'm like, if you want colorful corals, you need healthy corals and everything else will fall in line. So um, definitely looking forward to seeing all the Aussies and international travelers in Reefstock Australia. Make sure to check out reefstock.show, the website. Make sure to go to the Facebook event page for up to the minute announcement and make sure that you talk to this guy in Sydney in just a few weeks if you have any burning questions because he's going to give you some pra practical, pragmatic replies that I think you'll really appreciate that you'll be able to take home and uh, chew on for a while. So Chris, man, I, I, have, I have no criticism for you. I have no advice for you. You're the one usually uh, helping me out. Yeah. But uh, thanks a lot for sitting down and doing this interview. Oh, yeah. Thanks for and, coming uh, over. Looking forward to seeing everybody at Reefstock Australia. Yeah, see you soon.